before introducing our guest speaker, I would like to give you uh, some background on the history and purpose of the Hesburgh Lecture Series. Since 1986, the Hesburgh Lecture Series has brought a taste of Notre Dame's academic excellence to the Notre Dame clubs and their local communities. The lectures perpetuate the example of President Emeritus Reverend Theodore Hesburgh, CSC, as a lifelong learner and further the mission of Alumni Association by providing meaningful continuing education opportunities to Notre Dame alumni, parents, and friends. From seven lectures in the first year in 1986, the portfolio of lecture topics has expanded to 197 different presentations. And they have been given by 113 different faculty members on topics related to art, education, architecture, business, church, communications, economics, engineering, environment, ethics, family, life, government, history, law, science, social concerns, spirituality, and of course, Notre Dame. Annually, almost 5,000 alumni, parents, and friends attend Hesburgh lectures around the world. Tonight, I have the distinct pleasure of welcoming our esteemed Hesburgh lecturer, Professor William Evans, who will be providing us with a presentation on the Obama Health Care Reform Plan. Professor Evans received his PhD in economics in 1987 from Duke University and for 20 years was a faculty member in the Department of Economics at the University of Maryland. In 2007, he joined the Department of Economics at Notre Dame as the university's first Keogh Hesburgh professor, an endowed chair that was designed to attract scholars that not only advanced the academic <coughs> reputation of Notre Dame, but also enhanced Notre Dame's Catholic character and mission. His research covers a broad range of areas, including health economics and economics of education, and his work is routinely cited in academics as well as popular press. Professor Evans and his colleague Jim Sullivan are the co-founders of the Lab for Economic Opportunities, otherwise known as LEO, a research center in the College of Arts and Letters. LEO is a unique partnership between Notre Dame and Catholic Charities USA that provides research-driven poverty solutions. Professor Evans and his wife Eileen have three boys. Connor, a Notre Dame graduate of 2012, Brendan, Notre Dame 2015, and Patrick. I'd like to introduce Professor Evans. Thanks for the kind introduction. Uh, I'm going to try to do this without a microphone because I got one for the video camera. And uh, I would like to think that you're all here because of the scintillating conversation, but deep down inside I know you're here because you don't have season tickets for basketball. <laughs> so uh, uh, let me tell you a little story about Notre Dame clubs. Uh, these are why Notre Dame clubs are important. So my colleague, uh, former colleague Molly Lipscomb, had an undergraduate RA uh, who was using this very expensive software. The software was three times the cost of the laptop that it was on. The kid goes home over Christmas and he wanted to do some work over Christmas. And Molly said, you're gonna protect the laptop. You're gonna protect the laptop. And he said, yes, I will. The kid goes home, it's a snowy night. He's driving on a country road. He flips the car. The car is totaled. He walks out miraculously, he's fine but everything is pitched out of the car, including the laptop. It's the middle of the night, you're near some uh, uh, woods, they can't find the laptop, so he's petrified what's gonna happen. Molly wouldn't have done anything, but, so what's he do? He calls the local Notre Dame club. The next day, they bring out 25 people, they search the surrounding area, they find the laptop, lo and behold, it works. <laughs> That's the most amazing thing. So, thank you for Notre Dame clubs. Uh, all right, so this is a talk that I've been giving to a lot of Notre Dame clubs. There uh, seems to be some interest in healthcare reform these days. And uh, <clears throat> I've also been giving it to uh, some local community groups. On one day I gave this to uh, a group of estate planners in Indianapolis. The next day I gave part of this as part of a poverty summit. They had two very different interpretations of the law, but uh, it's been interesting to say the least. What I'm going to try to do in the talk is get this to work. What I'm going to try to do is two things, really. The first is, um, before we tar start talking about healthcare reform, we need to know about what the issues are. 
if you were going to design a healthcare package, if you were going to reform the healthcare system, what are the issues that you need to address? And once we have sort of some basis of conversation there, then we can ask, how did the uh, uh, ACA actually deal with this Obamacare? What did it do? What issues did it attack? And we're just going to try to give it a little scorecard, grade the outcomes of this. Um, I'm going to talk about four issues primarily in terms of what, the, what we need to attack if we wanted full-scale health care reform, access, costs, the Medicare time bomb, and tax equity. Uh, these are in no particular order, but they, in some respects, they're in the order in which the ACA actually dealt with them. Probably the easiest issue to attack, and the one that's gotten the most coverage, is the issue of access, who has insurance and who doesn't. These are numbers from the current population survey, which is the leading indicator of who does and does not have insurance. That shows in the top graph the number of people that are uninsured, and the bottom graph the fraction of people that are uninsured. And both these numbers are pretty staggering. Almost 50 million people don't have insurance, and this number is roughly about 16% of the population. There was a little bit of increase during uh, the recession. Um, some of this has uh, come back down a little bit, but still, the numbers are fairly staggering that such a large fraction of our population uh, in total, about 16%, does not have health insurance. Why don't people have health insurance? The reason why is because most people who get health insurance are getting it from their employers. Employers, when they are large, have an ability to provide health insurance, but when they're small, it's very difficult for them to do. And so if you are a person working for a very large company, 98% of the time you're going to be offered health insurance through your employer. However, once we get onto firms that are, say, 10 to 24 employees in size, almost 30% aren't getting health insurance. So most of the people who are not getting health insurance are going to be doing so because they work for small firms. To get put this into perspective, this is the fraction of people who are uninsured and it's broken up into many different groups. If you were to ask of people that are uninsured, what fraction have a full-time, full-year worker in their family? And that number is 67%. And so most people who are uninsured just happen to be working for a firm for whatever reason is unable to provide them with insurance. Most of the time it's because they're a very small firm. Why are small firms at a disadvantage? Well, most large firms are not buying insurance. They're acting as their own insurance company. They pay someone to process claims, but they're actually footing the bill up front for the insurance that you're getting. Any medical care costs are directly coming out of the University of Notre Dame's budget or IBM's budget or Xerox's budget. They're not buying insurance. If you're a small firm, you don't have the same advantage to run your own insurance company. You have to go buy insurance. Now, if you have a bunch of different small firms out there, some are going to want to buy insurance, some are not. What kind of firms do you think are going to be buying it? Well, the firms that have the greatest need for insurance, and therefore the ones that have the most sickest workers. On average, you're going to get what's called adverse selection, and so it's going to be priced accordingly. So if you're running a plumbing supply company or a little drugstore, you're going to have a very difficult time finding affordable insurance for yourself and your workers. If you do, you're, going to be having a, you're not going to have the advantages of large insurance pools. You're going to have to pay very high administrative costs because it's a small plan. You're going to have to pay for the profits for the firm that you're buying the insurance from. And there's going to be this problem of adverse selection. So as a result, small firms are at an incredible disadvantage to providing health insurance for their workers because we have this system generated by the tax code of providing insurance through the firm. Probably the most difficult issue to deal with in any of this is cost, and it's probably also the most misunderstood issue. The expenditures in healthcare are pretty dramatic. In 2010, we spent $2.6 trillion on healthcare, which is about $8,400 per person in this country, or about 18% of our gross domestic product. Staggering numbers for one sector of the economy. These numbers, however, are going to increase considerably over time as the population ages and as healthcare becomes more expensive. It's projected that in 2021, we're going to be spending $4.7 trillion on medical care, about $14,000 per person, and this is going to eat up about 30% of our gross domestic product for one particular industry, keeping people healthy. These are staggering numbers and numbers that are very hard to comprehend when you have to buy insurance, especially if you're self-employed or you're a small firm. The United States back in 2007 spent about $7,300 per person on health care. If you compare it to almost any other industrialized nation, we're spending an awful lot more. 
If we compare it to Canada or the United Kingdom, we're spending about 87% more per capita than in Canada and about 143% more than the United Kingdom. We spend a lot of money on medical care in this country, much more so than any other developed country in the world. If you were to just ask how much does it cost for health insurance, the latest survey from the Kaiser Family Foundation, that surveys firms that provide health insurance for their workers, the average individual plan costs about $5,400. If you want a family plan for four, this number is now over $15,000. So um, fairly large amount. When the median uh, family income is about $50,000, you're talking about one third of the, uh, um, of your, uh, about one quarter of your, uh, of your compensation package is going towards health insurance, all right? The big problem is that this number is high, but this number is increasing faster than prices in general. So if you take a look at overall inflation between 1999 and 2010, <coughs> prices went up by about 31%. Mean family income didn't exactly keep prices with uh, uh, <coughs> overall inflation, it only went up by 26%. If you ask what happened to health, health insurance premiums, they increased by 138%. We're spending an increasing fraction of our GDP on medical care and prices for those goods are increasing a lot faster than inflation. The problem for many people is that we're not appearing to get the bang per buck for our dollars in medical care. And it's relatively easy to generate some data that the United States is not exactly uh, winning the war in this context. The United States ranks 25th of 29 countries in life expectancy, 4.3 years shorter than Japan, and two and a half years shorter than Canada, who spends uh, half of what we spend. We're the 28th worst country, uh, or 24th of 28 countries in infant mortality, more than twice the rate of Japan, and about 30% higher than Canada in the United Kingdom. Now, in terms of these numbers, they are fairly uh, depressing in terms of uh, what we're getting, but it's, it's also fairly misleading in terms of um, uh, the, the impact that the medical care system has. And one question we want to ask, are high expenditures in medical care really a bad thing? So a key driver of health care costs and health care spending is technology. If you were to just take a look at new technologies, they are fairly effective at decreasing pain, making life more bearable, decreasing mortality, and they've been fairly dramatic over this time period. Mo many technologies available now weren't around 30 years ago. So if you just take a list of MRIs, angioplast, antipsychotropic drugs, hip and knee replacements, neonatal intensive care units, treatments for AIDS, statin drugs, these are all relatively recent innovations that are also very effective but very expensive. The progression of technology is what's really driving medical care expenditures. And as a result, we have high expenditures because we have a lot of technology. Healthcare might be the only industry where a growing fraction of GDP is considered bad. If we were to take an industry and say, hey, you're growing at twice the rate of the rest of the economy, people would stand up and cheer and say, that's a great thing. Why is it that we don't say that for medical care? What is it about medical care? Part of it is, I think, that we're pricing the wrong thing. If we go out and we take a look at prices for particular goods, what we do is hold everything else constant. We pick a 12-ounce can of soup off the shelf, and we hold that constant to figure out what the price is. We have a loaf of bread that weighs 22 ounces. We hold the size of the bread constant, and we can easily track the prices. That's not the same in medical care, because not all else is being held constant. Things change, productivity increases, and what we're interested in is what are we getting for that. If we take a look at some of the medical successes that have occurred over the past 30 years, they are fairly dramatic. Antiretroviral drugs for AIDS reduce mortality of AIDS patients by 70% in a short 18-month period, one of the most effective innovations ever on the pharmaceutical side. Neonatal intensive care units reduce mortality among lo very low birth weight children by 42%. Lipitor reduces LDL by 39 to 60% and reduces all-cause mortality for men by 12%. These are fairly dramatic numbers. And as a result, we are unable to necessarily hold quality constant as healthcare progresses. We're getting a lot for our extra dollars. The question is, are we willing to pay that? So far, we seem to be having this Jekyll and Hyde relationship. We like the technology. We don't necessarily want to pay for it. So we have to sort of come to grips with that issue. One thing to ask, are we getting our bang per buck, is to ask a different question, not what the aggregate mortality statistics are, but ask the question, if you were to get sick, where do you want to be treated for a disease, the United States or somewhere else? So let's take a look at the five-year cancer survival rates 
for breast, cervical, colon, lung, prostate, and thyroid cancer for seven different countries and ask where is it the highest? Well, it's highest in the United States for all six. So the United States does a very good job of treating you once you are ill. Doesn't necessarily do a good job of preventing you from being ill, but conditional on that you have a disease, this is clearly the place you want to be. If you were to ask what the 30-day hospital, uh, in-hospital mortality rates are for acute conditions like uh, stroke or heart attacks, the United States ends up to have much lower mortality rates than other developed countries in the OECD. We get a lot for our medical care dollar. In the aggregate statistics, it's hard to see. In the individual statistics, it's really easy to see. If you want to cut medical care costs, where can you find them? Well, there's a lot of administrative costs, especially in the private sector. In Canada, they spend about 3% of their medical care dollar on administering the system. They have a single-payer system. In the Medicare program in the United States, that number is 1.5%. In the United States, it's anywhere from 8 to 30%, depending upon the surveys. There's a tremendous amount of administration. If we could get that cost out of the system through electronic medical records, et cetera, there's potential savings to be had. One problem, though, is that if you want to reduce total medical care costs, you're going to have to make hard decisions because most medical care costs are expent on very sick people. And therefore, you can't take away costs from healthy people. You have to take spending away from people that are fairly ill. If you were to ask, of the fraction of the population in certain percentiles, what fraction of the population, or what fraction of the total medical care costs are they responsible for? If you take a look at the 5% largest medical care cases, they're responsible for half of medical care spending. If you take a look at the 20% largest medical care spenders, they're responsible for 80% of medical care spending. The big bucks in medical care are for very sick people. And so if you don't want to spend all that GDP on medical care, you've got to take it away from sick people. And we haven't been willing to make that decision in this country. And so therefore, we can't have it both ways. Oh, man, medical care is such a big cost of our GDP. We need to reduce it. Well, we don't seem to be willing to take it away from people. So we have to come to grips with that, those two uh, opposing forces. One area where we might be able to deal with some uh, uh, medical care uh, spending is that there appears to be a lot of unnecessary medical care. Um, and there appears to be a lot of heterogeneity in the way in which end-of-life care is administered throughout the United States. There's a fascinating project called the Dartmouth Atlas that has very detailed information about Medicare spending across the population. Uh, they break the world up into what functionally is counties. Think of those different blocks as counties. If you take a look at the lowest to highest spending per capita amounts in Medicare, the lowest to highest county vary by a factor of three. Somewhere the low, about $5,300 per person, and somewhere in the high, in excess of $16,000 per person. What's interesting is that medical need, as measured by things like heart attacks or smoking rates or obesity rates, don't vary by a factor of three across counties. And so there's a tremendous amount of heterogeneity in spending. Some areas are much more intensive in terms of their medical treatment. The darker areas are the much more intensive ones. Where do they happen to be? In very large cities with very large medical centers. That's where a lot of the technology is first instituted, and that's where a lot of the technology is used much more heavily. So a lot of the effort in the health care reform package and some laws passed beforehand is an effort to try to standardize care across areas to try to get some of this difference out. If you were to graph the lifespan of seniors across areas, it's not varying by three to one. And so it's not clear in medical areas where we're getting a lot more spending that we're getting much better returns. And so there appears to be some waste in the system that we could potentially deal with. The question is how? And that's the most difficult issue. And that's the one that's going to generate most of the discussion over the next decade. The next issue is one of finance. That's the Medicare problem. Uh, Medicare is one of the more successful public programs we've ever had. Uh, but it's also a very expensive program. In 2000, Medicare had 47 million recipients. It spent about $524 billion uh, in federal money. This took up about 3.2% of our GDP, or 16% of the federal budgets. As the baby boom generation ages over the next 30 years, it's expected that Medicare program is going to double in size almost to 87 million recipients. 
and uh, the total cost is going to double to about 6% of GDP between now and then. Uh, if you take a look at the projected cost of the Medicare pro program, the problem is, is that given current constraints in terms of what money is coming in and what we project costs are going to be, there's going to be a tremendous gap that we're not going to be able to fund. So in this graph here, this is from the trustees report on Medicare. The top black line, our expected cost over the next 100 years almost. The colored lines here represent where money's coming from. Primarily the Medicare program is funded by payroll taxes, premiums, and then general revenues. The white gap here is the gap that we anticipate. And so if we take a look at just around uh, 2040 when that baby boom, uh, the end of the baby boom has retired, it's estimated that the unfunded portion of the Medicare program is going to be 2% of our GDP alone. And so we have tremendous costs expected in the Medicare program over time that are not going to be met by the current structure of the program. So why is it that we're going to have such problems? Well, there's a problem of rising costs. We're in a sector where expenditures are increasing on a per capita basis, much more so than the rest of the economy. We have a rising number of eligible people because of the baby boom generation. But in some respects, we're also a victim of our own success and that Elderly people are living a lot longer now than when Medicare was started as a program in the 60s. There's also a problem that there's falling fraction of number of people to tax. When the Medicare program was started, there were a lot of people we could tax who were working to run the program. Now, birth rates are way down, the baby boom generation is retiring, so there's a lot fewer people to tax to keep the program up and running. Just to give you some numbers on this, we saw this one already. One of the most amazing things has been the increased uh, lifespan of people at age 65. So if you make it to age 65 back in 1950, you were expected to have 14 extra years of life. By 2005, this number had gone up to 19. So that's a tremendous increase. It's a 30% increase in life expectancy over a very short period of time. This is primarily due to the fact that we've done a much better job of treating the primary killer of people around 65, which is heart attacks. We've done a great job of treating heart attacks. Mortality has declined from that disease, and as a result, we're getting much longer life expectancy. If we take a look at people's conditional life expectancy at age 75, it's gone from 10 to 12. You say, that's only two years. That's a 20% increase. That's a tremendous change in life expectancy, conditional on, on being age 75, in a very short demographic window. If you ask where the costs are, the problem are is that we're living to be much longer in age, once you get to be older, you're getting up much more serious medical care costs. So if we take a look at the average person, 19 to 44, they're spending about $3,300 per person in medical care. If you take a look at someone who's 65 to 74, that should say they're spending about 12,000, but once you reach age 85, on average, you're spending about $26,000 a year in medical care costs. So in some respects, people used to die of heart attack. They never got to the point where they had very high medical expenses. And so part of the increased costs is the fact that we're a victim of our own success. Back in 1970, a couple years after we started the Medicare program, there was an average of five and a half people in the uh, workforce age that we could potentially tax to run the Medicare program. By 2040, it's estimated that this number is going to fall by more than 50% down to two and a half. So we're going to have fewer people to tax in order to run the Medicare program. And as a result, the burden on each of those workers is going to have to be a much larger amount than it is in today's dollars. The final issue that any major tax reform has to take into consideration is what's called tax equity. And economists are one of the few people that really talk about this issue. But the fact is, is that most people get health insurance through their employer, and the reason why is because health insurance is considered a tax-preferred compensation. If you receive health insurance from your employer, it is not taxed as income as if you were to get $100. The same thing can be said for contributions to your pension plan. What this does is greatly reduce the price of receiving medical care because there's a tax, you're paying it in bef uh, before instead of after tax dollars. And as a result, it has greatly decreased the price of providing medical care. This is a vestige of the World War II era. Back in World War II, we had wage and price controls. Firms were losing their workers to other firms because they couldn't give them a raise. 
you could get a raise if you changed employers. So one way they could keep the workers was to start providing fringe benefits. And that's where the health insurance from the employer started getting into the system. Over time, it was codified into law that this was a tax preferred method of compensation. And we've generated an entire system where now that 170 million people receive their health insurance through employer provided coverage. So it's one of the huge success stories in terms of the impacts of the tax code in terms of um, social benefits, but at the same time it generates some inequality. Let's consider a family that's making $70,000 in the state of Indiana. This person is facing a marginal tax rate of roughly 37%. They're going to pay 25% at the margin in federal taxes, 4% in state taxes, and roughly 8% in Social Security and Medicare tax. So suppose this person wants to just buy their family a relatively rot gut program of $12,000. Remember, the current family of five pack, or family of four program is about $16,000 now. So this isn't even the best potential program out there. Without the tax advantage of employer-provided health insurance, this person has to buy insurance in after-tax dollars. And given the 37% marginal tax rate, the employer provision of health insurance decreases the cost of that considerably. In order for you to receive $12,000 of insurance in before tax dollars, you got to get $19,000, or I mean after tax dollars, you get to get $19,000 in additional income. All the governments are going to take away $7,000 in taxes, leaving you with $12,000 left over. So the benefit here is roughly $7,000 to you. This greatly reduces the cost of having insurance. We now provide most of it through the employer side. And as a result, we have some tax equity associated with this. This costs the federal government about $250 billion a year in lost tax revenue. The tax break, however, is only available to people who have insurance. Who are the people most likely to have insurance? The highest income groups. And so as a result, from a tax standpoint, this is a benefit that's primarily providing benefits to high income groups and not providing benefits to low income groups. In economics, we call this a regressive tax. The tax benefit is greatest for people in high incomes because they also have the highest marginal tax rate. So if you're in the top tax bracket, you're paying roughly 45% of every dollar in taxes. You really want as much from your firm in these tax preferred vehicles because you're buying them all in before tax dollars and not after tax dollars. So the benefit is primarily to the high income groups. So with that as backdrop, let's talk a little bit about the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act, ACA, as it's typically known. We're going to go through an outline of what was in the law and then take a look at some likely consequences of how this is going to attack those four issues of access, costs, Medicare, and tax equity. First of all, the ACA was mainly a coverage bill. What the law tried to do primarily was to fill in the gaps that generated large numbers of uninsured people in the country. It didn't do, it, it's a fairly expansive law, but the primary outcome is going to be a reduction in the number of uninsured people. There was large scale insurance industry reform that instituted community rating and eliminated pre existing condition clauses. And we'll talk a little bit about that later on because I think this is the source of a lot of controversy associated with the law. The coverage expansions are achieved through a number of different vehicles. Probably the most controversial is the individual mandate, that individuals have to have health insurance or they are subject to a tax, up to 2.5% of your adjusted gross income. That hasn't kicked in just yet, it will kick in in a few years, but the individual mandate is far and away the most controversial portion of the bill. We'll talk about that in a little bit, and my interpretation is that it's really not there to increase coverage per se, what's there is to allow insurance industry reform. Some of the other vehicles that are generating increased coverage, one is a pay or play provision, which means if you are a firm with more than 50 employees, you are going to have to be providing health insurance for your workers of a qualified level or you're going to be subject to a tax on a per worker basis. Uh, there's going to be tremendous expansions of the Medicaid program to include a lot of higher income groups. So we're going to greatly increase the size of the Medicaid program. We're going to provide tax credits to the low income in the individual market. So if you're an uh, individual businessman and you're uh, relatively low income, you're going to be able to find heavily subsidized health insurance uh, now. There's going to be tax credits for small firms who are currently not providing health insurance to provide health insurance for their workers. 
and there's going to be the establishment of what are called insurance exchanges at the state and federal level where individuals can go buy group insurance at group rates, which is going to greatly decrease the cost since they don't have to buy it in the individual or small group market. Unfortunately, Indiana has kicked the can down the road. They have not gotten off the snide yet in terms of establishing what their state insurance exchange is going to work like. Uh, the past governor handed that task off to the new governor. Uh, so Indiana is a little bit behind the scenes in terms of the health insurance exchange right now. The insurance or the individual mandate was maybe the most controversial portion of the health insurance bill. It's thought to be necessary to have universal coverage, but what it's really necessary for were the large-scale insurance industry reforms that were made possible as part of the law. So the two things that established were community rating and elim elimination of pre-existing condition clauses. So right now, if you show up to buy insurance, they're going to charge you based on your past insurance history, based on where you live, a bunch of demographic characteristics, and therefore it can be incredibly expensive for you, especially if you have a history of high medical care costs. What's going to happen now is everybody in a local area in a certain age group is going to pay the same amount for insurance. So you can't discriminate against people based on their previous medical care conditions. Currently, they can uh, deny coverage um, if you have pre-existing conditions or charge you an arm and leg for it. That is going to be eliminated as well. So in order to establish community rating and eliminate pre-existing condition, you had to have a system where everybody was in the medical care insurance market. Think of the opposite. Suppose that we instituted community rating and we eliminated pre-existing condition clauses, but we didn't force everybody to have insurance. There are high spenders and there are low spenders. And what happens under community rating is you try to make it even such that everybody is paying the same amount. Well, the problem is the low spenders now are paying a lot more. So what are they going to do? They're going to exit the system. And as a result, the only people left are going to be the high risk group and their costs are going to go up. We experimented with this at the state level in the 90s and it failed miserably. It decreased coverage and it increased costs because the low risk people found increased spending or in increased insurance costs. So the way to prevent that was to make everybody in the system and the only way to do that was to institute the individual mandate. And so most of the law, if the individual mandate was struck down, was going to go through, what was going to be at risk was really the community rating and the elimination of pre-existing condition clauses. And so, you know, uh, I, I, you know, I, I think it's a, a, a subtle reason why that's in the law, but it's very important. It's essentially the whole, the ACA is really just the Massachusetts reform uh, at the national level because it, and, and it had the exact same structure. The impact on the insured is, uninsured is going to be the largest impact of the law. It's, it's estimated to reduce the uninsured by 32 million in 2019, which is a 60% reduction. This is still going to leave 23 million people uninsured. Uh, a lot of these are going to be Hispanics who are going to be overrepresented in this group because a lot of them aren't necessarily, you know, a lot of them here uh, uh, without documentation and so therefore they're not necessarily in the tax system. So they're not going to be subject to the tax. Um, so this is going to be the, probably the largest group that's going to be represented by the uninsured after the ACA is fully implemented. If you take a look at the balance sheet from uh, the ACA that was estimated by the Congressional Budget Office, it was estimated that the ACA was going to reduce the federal budget deficit by $142 billion over the first 10 years of the program. Overall, uh, let me see if I have this here. So the cost of the program, we're going to be about a half a trillion dollars to expand private insurance markets, another $400 trillion to expand the Medicaid portion of it in order to bring more people into the insurance, and the total cost was going to be about $935 trillion over a 10-year time period. The costs in the program were primarily uh, the revenues to pay for it were going to come from increased taxes. We'll talk about some of those in a minute. There's tremendous declines in reimbursement rates for doctors in the Medicare and Medicaid program that are going to go into effect in hospitals uh, that are going to tally almost $400 uh, uh, billion. Um, and so the total 
uh, revenues that are going to be generated by the bill was going to be about a little over one trillion dollars over a ten year time period. So this minus this is going to give us a reduction in the federal budget deficit of about 142 billion dollars. The law makes money. Now I think that that might be a more generous interpretation of what the law actually is doing for a number of different reasons. First of all, some of the provisions in the law that were supposed to save money are actually gone now. One of the original laws was called, the, one of the original components of the law was called the Class Act. This was going to be a long-term care provision that was going to be mandatory. You had to opt out in order to not be part of the class program. It was a long-term care program that was going to be administered at the individual firm level. Now the problem with the Class Act was that they were going to take, well, the benefit of it, they were going to take in revenues for about six years before they paid out any insurance claims. And so from an accounting standpoint, if you're only having to go out 10 years, you get a ton of money coming in and then you're paying everything out of the backside when the CBO is not estimating outside their 10-year window that they're legisl legislated required to estimate. And so as a result, the Class Act was going to generate $40 billion in revenues to this program. Well, that's gone because the uh, actuaries for Medicare and Medicaid said, look, this program is a financial nightmare. It can never work. It can never work. Half a year, year after the law was passed, they said, oh, you're right. We're going to take that out. So boom, $40, million, $40 uh, billion dollars of savings are gone already. The other thing about the a ACA is that it has relatively rosy scenarios about the future growth of Medicare costs. So for example, doctor fees in Medicare are estimated to be cut by 27% in January of 2013. It's coming right around the corner. This has been in legislation for about 15 years. It's always been amended and it's always been eliminated and the fees have been restored. However, if you are not paying out as much fees, it makes it the financial situation look a lot rosier. The actuaries for the Medicare program say it's important to note that the actual future costs of Medicare are likely to exceed those shown by the current law projections. We recommend that the projections be interpreted as an illustration of the very favorable <coughs> financial outcomes that would be experienced if productivity adjustments can be sustained in the long run. This is a polite way of saying we don't believe what's going on. So at the end of the day, there's some rosy scenarios and whether we're going to have $100 billion in savings I think is up in the air. I think there's a more general point that we need to deal with. One is that I think from a fiscal standpoint, the program that we need to deal with the most is Medicare. We need to deal with the Medicare time bomb in order for us to not necessarily have to deal with it 20 years in the future. If we take a little bit at a time, we can solve it. The problem is, is this program was fairly aggressive at cutting reimbursements to hospitals, to doctors in order to cut the cost in the Medicare and Medicaid programs. Well, what do we do with those cuts? Well, we paid for them in terms of benefits to insure more people. And so the fiscal thing that we need to do first, we've already paid out those benefits. And so has it reduced the deficit? Well, technically it has according to those calculations, but essentially you're robbing Peter to pay Paul. So uh, um, from a fiscal standpoint, I still think there's a lot of uh, issues associated with it. What's missing from the ACA? What I think is missing from the ACA is any cost controls. There's modest attempts at both to try to constrain costs. We're going to be adding 32 million people to the system who have insurance. The evidence is quite clear. When you have insurance, you're going to use medical care a lot more. And so as a result, there's going to be a big increase in the demand for services. And as a result, I think prices are going to go up even more. There are some modest attempts to control costs. There are accountable care organizations, which are like staff model HMOs that are cropping up all over the country that are allowed to be created as a result of the ACA. It's uncertain whether they're going to be able to extract costs out of the system. HMOs were fairly successful early on. They haven't been successful in the last decade or so. Accountable care organizations look a lot like HMOs, so it's not clear we're going to be able to constrain costs through there. There's no change in the supply whatsoever. So we have the same number of hospitals, the same number of doctors, the same number of nurses coming out. So as a result, we're going to have a lot of increase in demand in that particular market. We anticipate that we're going to have uh, some increased costs. There's actually could be some argument made that we're actually going to be worse off on the Medicare and Medicaid side because with the reduced reimbursements that physicians are going to see, a lot of people are going to stop taking patients. So it might make the situation even worse in order to try to find a medical care provider. 
Who are the winners from the ACA? Clearly the uninsured are gonna be the biggest winners. You're gonna be able to find affordable, high quality insurance that is uh, not currently available to you. In this group, workers at small companies are clearly gonna be, able, are gonna be much better off. Now they're gonna have access to the group market through health insurance exchanges. They're gonna be able to get health insurance. If they were receiving health insurance from their employer currently, they're gonna get a lot lower cost as a result of the health insurance exchanges. Um, there's going to be heavy subsidies for uh, low income workers and so therefore the dollar cost of their health insurance out of pocket is going to be a lot lower than it was. So that group's going to make out considerably. At the end of the day, uh, I think the evidence is clear that hospitals, prescription drug companies and medical technology companies are going to make out in the long run. We're going to insure 32 million people. This group is sicker on average, uh, holding age constant and with insurance they're going to start to use services. What's the evidence of this? Well, the stock price of hospitals, prescription drugs, and medical technology companies tended to increase every time we increased closer and closer to having health care reform. Uh, one of our undergraduates had a, a pretty, uh, pretty impressive paper on this um, that took a look at what happened to stock prices of firms any time there was some movement towards uh, passing the ACA. And it was fairly clear that major prescription drug companies, medical technology companies, hospitals especially, um, we're big winners of this. Um, who are the losers? Uh, for those of you in a Medicare Advantage, which is the HMO version of Medicare, reimbursements to that program have been cut considerably and so I think there's going to be tremendous retrenchment in the Medicare Advantage program. Uh, over time it's going to be harder and harder to find uh, providers that are going to want to be part of that. Uh, the small group market, if you're per currently selling insurance to that, I don't think this portion of the market is going to exist in a few years because the health insurance exchanges are going to be a much better deal for most people. If you're a worker with a high cost health insurance plan right now, your firm is subject to a tax if the health insurance plan has an actuarial value above, say, $20,000. So unions, uh, some uh, fairly high uh, cost plans at other manufacturing companies are going to be subject to a tax, and so therefore I think the generosity of those plans is going to get hit. One weird thing of the ACA is they had a tax on tanning salons. And so uh, for some reason, someone got ticked off by tanning salons on Capitol Hill, and so they got nabbed. Uh, if you take a look at the stock prices of generic drug manufacturers as uh, the ACA got closer and closer to passage, they actually fell. And part of it was is that as a buyout to the prescription drug companies for favoring uh, Healthcare reform, they extended the patent life of uh, name brand drugs, which hurts the generic market. And so generic drug manufacturers, I think, are going to lose out. And then state budgets in some states are going to really take a hit. As states are required to cover more people as part of the Medicaid program, they're going to get reimbursed for some of that from the federal government, but it's not going to be the same. Uh, some states, like Massachusetts, they're actually going to make money. In states like Texas, it's a bloodbath in terms of the fiscal side. And so as a result, um, I think some state budgets are gonna be in very bad shape. So where is the uncertainty associated with this? Uh, I think there's a lot of uncertainty associated with how much we can actually squeeze out of the Medicare program. And so right now, there's fairly large cuts that are scheduled to go into effect on January 1st. Every year for about the past decade and a half, we've been able to prevent those cuts from happening. It's unclear whether that's gonna happen or not. Um, can accountable care organizations re re reduce the growth of cost? It's, un, uh, it's not clear that that's going to happen. One of the big uncertainties is in order for you to not be taxed for not having health insurance, you have to have what's called a qualified plan. So what the government has to do is define what is a qualified plan. And so that's where the controversy associated with the contraceptive mandate comes in. The, con the mandate says in order to have a qualified plan, you have to be providing contraceptive coverage. And so all the decisions about what's going into the qualified plan have not been established yet. Some principles for what the qualified plan has to look like were released about 10 days ago, but the final characteristics of what a qualified plan is haven't been established. That could be a Christmas tree for different kind of providers. You might require them to cover acupuncture and uh, alternative medicines and homeopath and things like that. If they can withstrain, with, you know, have show some restraint, it might not be as bad, but uh, that still has to be decided. Um, can the health insurance exchanges control cost? 
Uh, I think that's the big experiment from the healthcare reform that we don't know much about. Uh, the ability for people to buy group coverage uh, in these fairly large markets. And the big uncertainty, the whole thing that keeps Treasury up at night, is how many people are going to get subsidized coverage. If your income is $80,000 or below, you're eligible for some sort of coverage if you have to go into the individual market and buy health insurance through an exchange. So it's fairly high income thresholds in order to, uh, that allow you to receive some benefits. The big surprise in Massachusetts when they had their health care reform was how many people qualified for subsidized coverage. And so what keeps the Treasury up at night is how many people are we going to have to subsidize. They have a guess of what that is, but in reality what that number is going to be is, is, uh, is anyone's guess. So those are some of the things that uh, I've gleaned from the ACA. Uh, it's a fairly ambitious program in one respect uh, in terms of uh, trying to increase coverage. The one thing that is kind of um, unsettling for an economist is that you know, we have this very awkward system where if you make buckets, you also have to be an insurance company because you provide, have to provide insurance for your workers. If you make transistors, if you make uh, computer chips, if you make tasty cakes, you, don't, you not only have to be an expert in tasty cakes, but you have to be an expert in insurance, which is the craziest system in the world. And so we have this system that's established where you have to provide insurance for your workers. That's just the norm. And now it's codified in the law or we're going to tax you. It would be nice if firms didn't have to do what they're not supposed to do, and they're supposed to make buckets, they're supposed to make tasty cakes, they're supposed to make ho you know, it's, uh, so it's, it, I think a lot of firms would like to get out of this business of having to be an insurance company. Um, and, but we're kind of stuck with that system now. And uh, it's not clear how we can get out of it, but um, you know, it, it's always been an awkward system, and it's been an accidental system, and we didn't, we, we kept it, and we built out from the, uh, uh, from the, and try to backfill in where the, where, the, where the gaps were happening. But we're kind of stuck with that system. It would be nice to sort of start from scratch and try to figure out a, a better way to sort of set this thing up and not be such a burden um, and not be so uh, inequitable. But uh, we didn't do that. So we're, we're stuck with that system. So I'm open for questions now. I'm sure you got a bunch of them. Uh, yes. All states are supposed to buy uh, sometime later in 2013 expand their uh, Medicaid to 80,000 per family and four. And of course, they're not going to be able to do that two years, three years, they're not going to be able to do that period. And then you just brought up that uh, you're concerned about the subsidized coverage of 80,000. Yeah. Both well, of those don't even make sense. There's one mandate saying the state will do that. So, so both those statements that were made also for you, so they don't add, they don't, they can put so the, one or the other. So not everyone who's going to get subsidized care is going to get it through the Medicaid system. Some people whose incomes are high enough, are, but not too high, are going to receive a subsidy, but they're going to have to go into the health insurance exchanges and buy their insurance. The Medicaid program is going to expand considerably, not all the way to the 80,000, but you are right that the government is shifting a lot of this burden down to the states. Now, so now, but some of the states have relatively generous Medicaid programs already, and therefore the reimbursement levels that they've set up are such that they're not going to be hit nearly as hard as others. And so about 26, 27 states are going to do incredibly well under medical care reform because they're going to get a positive flow of funds from the federal government as a result of expanding their Medicaid programs. A bunch of other states are going to be hit pretty hard. And so it, depending upon the underlying state characteristics for you, I think Texas is going to get the worst hit. Um, but some of the states that have fairly generous Medicaid programs now that cover a lot of people aren't going to take nearly the big hit that others are going to take. Yes. You pointed out that uh, most of our money for health care goes to the older person, especially in the last years and months of his or her life. Yes. I've heard that England has a formula in which the health of the patient, the outcome of the therapy are all calculated 
and then only so much is awarded. Do you know anything about that? So I, I, I don't know about this particular formula, but um, I do know that in systems like England, which are a single payer system, it is much more difficult to get particular types of care because there's a fixed amount of knee replacements, there's a fixed amount of uh, surgeries that you can do in any particular time. There are capacity constraints. Uh, and so in one respect, that's much easier to control cost because you have a central budget and you can say, we have a 300,000 knee replacements that we're going to do this year. If you don't get it, you're going to have to be pushed off till the next year. And so there are a lot more, they have a much greater ability to control spending in the UK because they have a global budget and they can just budget so much for each of these. And so as a result, however, it might take you a lot longer to get your knee replaced. It might take you a lot longer to get your uh, uh, cabbage surgery. Um, in the United States, we are much more aggressive at spending at the end of life than anywhere else. I worked in hospice for a long time. So, yeah, and so, um, and it's, it's not clear that we're getting what we need out of it. Um, my mother-in-law just died from pancreatic cancer, and she was in a hospice, and I've, I'm a big fan. I mean, I think it was a very dignified way to go. Now, she could have been very aggressive in terms of trying to have a small probability event. She wasn't eligible for surgery. Radiation or chemotherapy potentially could have been uh, useful, but it would have been an amazingly difficult for her, and there was a small probability of success. So as a result, the hospice was a very positive option for her because I thought it was a very dignified way to die. It was her decision, that's right. And so, but I think in this country we don't have that. I think most people want to be as aggressive as possible at the end of life. And so as a result, we have a ton of spending at the very end of life. And it's unclear how successful or how useful this is and whether it's actually positive for the people. My grandfather, he was 92, he was diagnosed with uh, leukemia and his physician wanted to start him on a regimen for chemotherapy at 92, which had a low probability of success. But he, thankfully, he uh, decided to move in with his daughter, and he had a fairly peaceful last couple months, um, you know, and, uh, that instead of the pain and suffering associated with being in leukemia. So in order for us to sort of get that out of the system, I think we have to have a different way in which we think about dying. And, uh, and right now, we're we have kind of a TV show mentality where we want to do as much as possible to try to keep the people alive. Sometimes with very little result to show for it. Um, and so I, I think that's an issue that we're going to have to deal with in the future. Um, there's also a lot of different aspect of this picture. I'm German, as you can hear from my accent. My father was in the hospital. I thought you were from Alabama. Too, <laughs> so. no, 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 no. He was in the hospital. He came into a, the hospital. He came in with a heart issue. And he was in the hospital. He was 12 hours in the hallway because there was no room free. The hospital had no air conditioning. There were three to four people in the room. I'm not quite sure. When you ask him about what country you want to come in the hospital, not in Germany. Yeah. <laughs> no matter what, how low the cost is. Now, I'm not quite sure if this really falls under a dignified life to the end of life. I'm really not sure. So. My point is that you get what you pay for in a certain way, the solid health system. And uh, to compare costs here in the UK, yes, it's right. You, if you come to a scandal of the year and you come as a normal patient, you do not get the medication because the plan is for it. That's right. If you are in a normal health care system, you do not get the medication somebody who's in privately insured because you are in the normal health system and maybe door is out, you don't get it. You do not get other medications. If you come, the doctor said, yeah, I have prescribed this already 55 times. You're number 56. You don't get it. Yeah. No, so I, I agree with you in, in one respect, in that I, from my standpoint, the US medical care system is amazingly successful on many different dimensions, OK? And we sit there and say, oh, wow, we're spending way too much money on medical care, until you try to take it away. They say, no, 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 no. I don't want to have my medical care taken away. And so we have to sort of start thinking about this thing in a one common framework, um, but we're not to that point yet. And I, I completely agree that I think that uh, you do get what you pay for, and people are spending one half of what they are, but in acute cases, you're not going to get the same level of care that you are in the United States. If you have a heart attack in this country, you get 
treated relatively quickly. You have a lot of advanced medication um, and uh, you have a lot of advanced treatments that are available to you. That's not the case everywhere else. I used to have a slide in here, the uh, premier of Newfoundland. He had to have a heart surgery. He did not go to Canada, he went to Miami. And he was very open about it. He said, look, they do a much better job down there than they do here. I'm going to where there's the best doctors. And so he, re he wasn't reelected, but he had good heart surgery. So. Oh, we're, we're also, I think, going against the stream that our healthcare is so good that we don't eat right, we don't we smoke, we don't live lifestyles that help promote health. Figuring we can get fixed up at a later time. Yeah, well, at the end of the day, that's right, but at the end of the day, though, it's not clear that reducing smoking or reducing obesity is actually going to save money over the long run. So let me just show you this. So I, I get this question a lot. So as people age, they spend a lot more in medical care. And it is clear that in any age, people that smoke or people that have uh, high obesity rates are spending a lot more in medical care at any age. But what happens is that people who have a high obesity rates or who smoke don't live as long. So they never get to the point where they're spending nearly as much on medical care as others. And so if you take a look at a graph that represents the relationship between spending and age, that's going to be going up for the not obese people. And it's going to be a lot higher for the obese people. So now through age A1, area A plus B is total spending for the obese. Area B is the spending for the non-obese. And so clearly there's a lot more spending over the first A1 years. Well, what's the problem? The people who are obese are going to die early, and the people that are not obese are going to live a lot longer. And so therefore, they're going to live at age A2, and they're going to generate C dollars worth of spending. And so what's going to happen is, is this area bigger than this area? And so if you cut smoking, if you reduce obesity, in any year you're going to save money, but it's not clear that you're going to be saving money over the long term. And so uh, it's because those diseases are going to keep people alive, or are going to kill people earlier, and they're not going to get to the point where they're going to have really, really high medical care costs. Um, and so I, had, I was part of a book uh, where the topic of the book was Envision a World Without Smoking, and what's going to change? Uh, and there was one interesting chapter about what's going to happen to total medical care costs, and the answer is not very much because the people who quit smoking are going to live a lot longer and they're going to have a lot more costs in the future. And so from a life cycle perspective, it's not clear that you're going to save all that much money by reducing obesity and smoking and things like that. I agree with you that those things are one of the reasons why the United States has a much higher death rate, much higher or much lower life expectancy than other countries, but from a medical care standpoint, over a life cycle perspective, which is what we're going to be interested in, it's not clear what's going to happen. Yes? You indicated uh, <clears throat> when uh, you started that uh, our per capita expenditures are really high yeah, compared yeah. to other countries, and you gave some, uh, <clears throat> showed some numbers and what have you, but then you, when you kept going, you indicated that some of those countries are having better results than we are. So they're having yeah. better results in like these aggregate statistics like infant mortality and uh, life expectancy. And so, uh, so part of that is kind of the unique aspects of the United States. And so let's step back a second. What drives life expectancy rates is what happens to very young because if you die early, you take someone out of that calculation and have a low number for them. Or if we do a much better job of treating heart attacks, then we're having a large class of people that are living a lot longer. And so those are the two big drivers of these aggregate statistics. In the United States, we have a fascination with two things that other countries don't have, guns and cars. And so the murder rate in the United States is five times what it is anywhere else. The victims of murder are all primarily young people. And so that is a huge knock to our life expectancy numbers. The other thing that we have fascination with is cars. The United States has twice the motor vehicle fatality rate than any other country in the developed world. 
Most victims of automobile crashes are young people. We take those people out of the calculations, we're really driving down the life expectancy numbers. So we do have in these aggregate statistics some worse indicators, but it's not clear it's due to bad medical care on our part. So, yes? During the election cycle, um, a topic came up of an administrative board under the ACO yeah. that the popular press seemed to say they dealt with end-of-life issues. And some people referred to them as death panels. What is your understanding of that issue? So, okay, what's going to happen is there is a firm belief that a lot of the medical care spending, especially in the Medicare program, is wasted. And much of that is due to the cross-area variation in spending. The difference between the lowest and the highest county is 3 to 1. The difference in the health in those counties isn't 3 to 1. And so there's going to be an attempt over the next decade to try to standardize the protocols for care. And so if you present with X, we're going to give you Y. If you present with Z, we're going to give you W. And so what they're going to try to do is make it such that we're going to have less variation in this type of care. And so what the panels are going to be impounded to do is essentially develop guidelines. So now the notion of a death panel is there's going to be people saying, oh, Bob, he's not strong enough for a heart, attack, or for a heart transplant. He's not going to get it. That's not what they're going to be doing. What they will be doing is saying, here's what you present with. Here's what you're eligible to be treated with. And therefore, they're going to try to take the, vari the, the doctor's variation out of the decision. Doctors are going to hate this. Okay? That is the big, I mean, there's, there's $3, tr $3 billion that are uh, in research about what are going to be standards for care. And so there's not going to be death panels per se. What they are going to do is try to standardized protocol for dealing with particular cases. If you present with this, you're going to get this, and that's what you're eligible for. So, um, so they're not going to be deciding on individual cases, saying, you know, Bob's too frail to get a heart, uh, heart transplant. But they're going to say, if you present with X, Y, and Z, then you're not eligible for certain things. That hasn't, none of that's been done yet. None of that's been done. And that's where, the, that's where, all the, that's where a lot of the fighting is going to be over the next decade. Yes? Uh, I think we have more experience with Medicaid because we've only been providing prescription coverage for Medicare in the past few years. So over the past 15 years, Medicaid is the primary provider of drugs in many different classes because a lot of people are eligible for Medicaid program if you have a particular disease. So the two biggest examples are AIDS and schizophrenia. 75% of schizophrenics are on the Medicaid program, and almost all the drugs are coming through Medicaid. About 60% of AIDS patients are on the Medicaid program, and almost all the drugs are being paid for by the, Medicare program, by the Medicaid program. The two fastest growing drug classes, uh, this probably ended around between 95 and 2005, were schizophrenic and antiretrovirals for, for AIDS patients. The Medicaid program has never had the will or the ability to constrain the medical care cost that is paying for drugs. And so it's not clear how you're going to get that out of the system. Um, and it's, I, I don't think it's just a question of power. I think it's a question of political will. Because you're going to have some fairly significant country, companies take fairly large hits in their stock prices if you were much more aggressive in terms of what Medicare and Medicaid are reimbursing for particular drugs. And so I don't think we've ever had the will to really attack that issue. Uh, I think that they may have enough arrows uh, in the quiver to do this. We just haven't had the political wherewithal to actually implement it. So one, one more question? Go ahead. On insurance exchanges like Indiana, who's opted out of 
Yeah. As I, my understanding is, then the federal government steps in and sets up an insurance exchange. Or you can buy it from the federal government from the federal exchange. Yeah. Now, is that a is that a national exchange, or is it, do they set one up for each state that's opted out? No, I think it's going to be a national one. So I think that's what's way, way it's going to work. And so for, so for some people in Indiana, it's going to actually going to be, so in northern Indiana, I think, has higher than average medical care prices than the rest of the country. And so northern Indiana, I think, is going to make out. But if you're in the middle of Indiana, medical care costs are not nearly as expensive. You're going to be paying more than you would have if you had, say, a statewide exchange. And so I think there's going to be some geographic disparity as a result of this um, if, if Indiana never sets up an exchange. Okay. I hate to cut the question short. This is going to really create a lot of discussion uh, in the future. Um, I want to thank Professor Evans for being here tonight and giving me a hand.